Welcome back to the Fantasy Network, everyone. My name is, of course, Jimmy Nuts, and I have to tell you right now, just before we get started, I am very sick. I uh, was supposed to do this video like four or five days ago, and I got COVID, and it has been whooping me up and down the street. I mean, it, it has been bad. I've been getting absolutely hammered by this thing, and today I feel about 60%. Um, I'm going to try not to sniff and cough and wheeze and try not to get too short of breath, but uh, I need to get this done. I need... it's. We're already in like the fourth day of the month and I feel pressure. I need to get this out. Uh, and I want to talk about the cool books that I read in the month of July uh, and what to look forward to in August. And I have to do the Patreon pick, of course, because it's my favorite time of the month. So uh, without any further ado, we're going to wrap this up. But I'm just apologizing in advance if I sound bad or if, uh, man, I'm already tired doing this. Uh, it's a little bit rambly. I do have a little bit of brain fog, uh, but I'll, I'll try to do my very best for you. And I appreciate you showing up to this. The first book that I wanted to talk about in this wrap up is the one that I feel like I have the most to say about. And it's one that I was going to record a vlog for. But unfortunately, uh, I lost some of the footage and then the audio for the existing stuff wasn't as good. Uh, so I ended up having to scrap it, which really bummed me out quite a bit. And that is Coo Shields Dart by Jacqueline Carey. This was uh, Curran's pick, one of my patrons. This is a Patreon pick for July. And this is a book that I've been wanting to read for a very long time. The kind of MO of this series when it gets brought up in conversations in circles is the fact that it is the BDSM fantasy smut epic fantasy thing, right? Like that's all I ever heard about it. And it seems to be that this is a book that maybe is getting misrepresented just a little bit because it's actually a whole lot more of like a chronicling of someone's life, Fedra, who's the main character, uh, and also just a a mountain of political intrigue and court intrigue that is really, really well done. But they weren't lying about the BDSM and they weren't lying about the spice. This thing is as spicy as anything I've ever read. And we're not talking about BDSM where it's, you know, a little choke, you know, a little face tap. We're talking about some really extreme BDSM elements into this and I it would be disingenuous of me to say that some people aren't going to be completely turned off of this because of those because some of them made me squirm a little bit it's Fedra telling her story and it is this political epic in in many ways that just happens to also use romance as much as uh violence or as much as intrigue it, it is a huge element of the story and the way that Fedra is telling you the story and the way that it is written is just excellent. The setting of the story is also really interesting in the fact that, you know, obviously it's first person narrator and she's explaining to you this world. And it seems like it's almost like an alternate version of like medieval Europe, possibly uh, with totally different names and everything. So it is a secondary world, but very reminiscent of that. There's like a Jesus like character in the history or the mythology of this world. Uh, and then a son of the Jesus like character, which I believe is named Alua. And the people that are in Fedra's territory are like Alua's chosen. And then there was disciples of Alua, one of them being Nama. And that is like, essentially, I thought felt like the Mary Magdalene kind of, but maybe maybe that's not a great comparison. But Nama eventually sleeps with a king to get Alua out of jail. And that opens up this big like order of followers of Nama who basically use sexual favors to do you know their religious favors or whatever um it's kind of how like they worship i guess in some ways and jacqueline carey writes fedra in such a way where you really feel like this is a character that has been brought up in this order of romance and sexuality and uses it to great extents and, and to great effect, I think. And the writing from the perspective is so ridiculously strong. Like the thing that you can take away from this as the biggest positive of the series is that Jacqueline Carey is just a tremendous author. The one troubling thing I had with kind of this setup is that Fedra, we get introduced to her when she's very young and is, is kind of like abandoned and given up by her parents. And she's only 10 years old when she or enters like into service of Nama and she goes to this ritual where she's basically watching two people have sex and she's very young. So in a lot of ways, I felt like Fedra was a victim of this order or of this structure of their society, except Fedra never really sees it that way. And to me, you know, it almost feels like in some ways you're kind of like grooming here, which is, it, it makes me feel a bit skeevy. I don't, I don't necessarily love that. But Fedra's perspective is that it was more empowering. So like I have this kind of tussle back and forth of like, how much of this is unreliable narration? And then how much of this am I supposed to question about the in-world and critique the in-world structures? So like that part of it, like really made me feel uneasy and was not exactly my favorite. Uh, but then later on, this story goes from like, you know, everything I've said, it goes to some places that you would never, ever guess. And that's what makes this such a weird read is like, 
yes, as far as political in intrigue, you know, that is what is at the core of the story. And it is done so very well. Like if you like political intrigue, you will most likely enjoy this story. But just where the cast of characters from where you start to where you end up in the middle of the book is like really wild. And that could lead to you feeling like maybe it's out of left field or some people are going to find it as a welcome change and just Jacqueline Carey taking the story in places that you don't expect and really opening up the scope of the world and the characters. Of course, there, there are a ton of characters uh, in this book. And I will say it was a pretty dense read because Jacqueline Carey leaves no stone unturned, no detail unspoken. And there's a ton of exposition, but because it's in the first person, like I'm telling you a tale format, it makes it way more digestible because if, you know, Fedra was writing this in world to send to somebody, she would absolutely need to explain for people who are reading this in the future, the context of what she is living in. So it makes the exposition a little bit more digestible. The story would have lulls where like, I didn't feel like I was super duper invested, but every single time I was about to kind of be like, all right, maybe this is going, you know, maybe this is really going to be a slog. Jacqueline Carey would make a turn or a twist or a shocking moment that were really impactful and effective that, that ended up getting me pretty invested in the story, especially by the end. So I love the ending. I love how it comes back to more of what it was at the beginning uh, without saying any spoilers. This is definitely not one of my favorite books of the year. This is also not a book that I would say I loved all the way through. But what I can say about this is that if some of the things that I've kind of mentioned here sound striking to you, I would not be shocked to have new readers pick up this book and be like, whoa, why aren't more people talking about it? Especially if you're OK with a little bit more of the extreme BDSM elements of the story. And maybe you actually do want a little bit more romance in your fantasy. Uh, I think that this could be the one for you without full blown going into the romance side, which is totally acceptable. But I know some people want a good mixture of that. I think this is probably that and also gives a lot of range to the act of, of sexual activity. Right. And, and it can be a thing of love. It can be a thing of passion or it could also be a tool. Uh, it can be powerful. It can be manipulating. So the the wider range of what that is to somebody uh, is is kind of inspected in every single aspect. Fedra's interactions um, with people are different based on what she needs from them or what she has found in that person. And I think that that's pretty powerful. So this is a good book. Uh, I think for some people, it's going to be great. I think for some people, it's going to be unbearable, maybe even just boring for, for some. But uh, the thing that I took away from is that Jacqueline Gary is just a phenomenal author. I don't know if I'll continue the series, but I'm so glad I finally got to read it. Definitely some spice in that one. The next book I wanted to talk about is Neuromancer. I had no intention of reading this, but my good friend Kai, this is a book that he really enjoyed uh, and it's one of his favorites. So I wanted to read it. Also, uh, I've, I've seen other people picking it up and really enjoying it. And cyberpunk is never something that I walk into the bookstore looking for. I never have been really into the aesthetic of it. It's not that it's I hate it. It's just not like if someone's like, oh, yeah, it's cyberpunk. It doesn't go up the TBR. It might go slightly down the TBR, but I don't outright disdain it. This book was shocking to me and the fact that I think that uh, William Gibson is just an unbelievable writer. Uh, the dialogue in this story was absolutely incredible. And the thing about cyberpunk that I would say that has resonated with me the most is the movie The Matrix. And now having read Neuromancer, I'm like, oh, The Matrix should have said, thank you, William Gibson, for creating Neuromancer, because this is the... <laughs> This is the book that really set up a lot of this stuff. Everything that has come since then, you can see things pulling certain elements of this, but it really feels like, from what I've experienced in any medium, this feels like the best representation of cyberpunk. And a couple of people read this in my Discord, and some people were saying, you know, it jumps around a lot, and I had trouble with that. But for me, this story does jump scene to scene, and it, is, it feels quick to me. And instead of feeling jarring, it actually had me super duper engaged. Like I was holding on to my handrails, just wondering where Gibson was going to take me next. With all of this, uh, I really liked the main character. I thought that uh, Case was really, really cool. And I also enjoyed Molly quite a bit as well. Uh, so without saying much else more about it, and you know, trying to keep it spoiler free, I just think that this is like, Definitely one of the more monumental pieces of sci-fi that I've read. And I actually, I'm going to turn this on and I'm going to give Neuromancer the nut button. I mean, I really enjoyed it. I thought the conversations between people were the most gripping aspects of it, but also just like the trippy reality, right? Of jacking in and then going into the cyberspace. All that stuff is so cool. And a lot of stuff that, that people use in sci-fi, not just cyberpunk, but sci-fi or everyday life, you know, he kind of coined a lot of those phrases, which is really neat. And it's not one of those things where it's like, I respect this because it was first, but it wasn't that enjoyable. No, like not only do I have an immense amount of respect for Neuromancer, but I also just loved reading it. And I will read more William Gibson because his writing also tremendous. Everyone says the first lines of this book uh, are, you know, one of the best openings ever. And I 
absolutely agree, but it doesn't stop there. Like William Gibson just writes a really gripping, tight novel throughout all of Neuromancer. And uh, this is one I would love to, to read again, and maybe I'll even read the sequels. I did a reading vlog this past month where I talked about Lamentation by Ken Scholes, which is the uh, Psalms of Isaac. I always have to look it up, which I said was four books in my reading vlog. It's actually five. I apologize for that. And uh, I also covered The Long Tomorrow by Lee Brackett. Both are po post-apocalyptic works. Uh, sci fantasy, you could maybe put them both into that. Um, I would say The Long Tomorrow is more like speculative fiction sci-fi, whereas Lamentation is like a fantasy with some sci-fi elements uh limitation reminds me a lot of the dying earth genre where like a lot of the magic is actually technology that's been forgotten uh and, and a decent amount of intrigue in it as well though never to the full extent i think of what jacqueline carey goes for in kushiel's dart still a respectable amount I and mean, it was pretty good with a lot of really good twists lamentation definitely made me want to read the sequels which is the exact thing you want out of a book one uh i love the fact that we're in this this really weird i think i think it's a post-apocalyptic earth i don't even remember if that was actually confirmed by the time i ended the book but like there's a pope and religion's a really big thing and the history of everything but there's also these servos mecha robots that are in it and the equivalent of a nuclear bomb goes off in the major city and they lose all the information from a library like a lot of premise things that I really liked about Lamentation, and I thought Ken Scholes, especially for a debut, just really knocked it out of the park, and it's one of the series that I'm most excited about uh, when I think about stuff that I want to continue. I mean, I start a lot of series. I don't finish a lot. I have full intentions of finishing Psalms of Isaac, uh, and Ken Scholes is definitely one of the more underrated debut authors that I've read, uh, for sure. The Long Tomorrow, super short read, no audiobook, unfortunately. Uh, what a great book. I mean, just a tremendous book. Uh, I'm going to give Long Tomorrow the nut button. I'm not going to give it the Lamentation, uh, just because I'm kind of wanting a little bit more from it, and I think the things were set up to give me that, so I'm sure the sequels might end up getting the nut button. But The Long Tomorrow by Lee Brackett is just absolutely incredible. Um, you know, a little bit younger protagonist makes it feel like a younger book, but still dealing with very heavy themes and able to give you the cloud of a post-apocalyptic earth and the despair of it without feeling necessarily like overwhelmingly depressing. And I really, really enjoyed that. Uh, and a good look at religion and knowledge and how those things intertwine. Does one take you further from the other? I'm not sure. Uh, but w one of the better standalone sci-fi books that I've read, and especially coming in at like, I think it's less than, or I don't know, it's less than 300 pages for sure. Uh, very, very short book. It might be under 200 pages. I can't remember right now. But uh, go watch that reading vlog if you're interested in either of those books in more detail. I go through all of it spoiler-free in the reading vlog that's on the channel. Uh, but really loving the post-apocalyptic kick that I've been on. I am struggling here. The day, I've, I've just slammed Dayquil and... and uh, caffeine and I feel like my brain is melting. Uh, Pop 1280 is the last book I'm going to talk about in my wrap up and that is by Jim Thompson who's kind of a legend. Pop 1280, this was reckon to, recommended to me from Carlos and Yolanda over at StoryTube. I love them very, very much. I'll be seeing them in September which is going to be exciting. Uh, they recommended this to me because I was looking for like a short book to fit in that last week right before the month ended and you know this is about a sheriff who is really bad at his job and is definitely um not a great guy, and I think a bit of an unreliable narrator at times, uh, you could say, and is certainly one of the most psychological reads I've had this year. Um, I use that term a lot whenever I'm in a, a, a the mind of a problematic character, and it's because you're trying to decipher, you know, what they're telling you versus what's actually happening, and then trying to figure out exactly who or what this person is. And this is one of those books that's really short, and I can't tell you much more without ruining it, and I really do not. I do not recommend that you read the back of this book or look up a summary. If you're wanting to read about a really bad sheriff that does some bad things, I would suggest this. There is um, an uncomfortable amount of racism in this book, not because the author is endorsing racism, but because it is the time period of which it's in. And this, again, it's not a great guy that we're following around. Um, I... I thought that that it made it a really tough read. Like I didn't feel very good after I finished this book. I can tell you that. Uh, but it made you think, and it also made you wonder everything you had read prior, you know, when you finish the book and you close it, a lot of the context changes. And those are some of my favorite reads. Um, but just the, Oh man, the, the, the content in the book is very rough to get through. So this is not something that's going to be for the weak of heart, but you know, Carlos joked and said, it's like child of God, but good. Uh, Your Child of God by Cormac McCarthy. And I would agree with that. I think it's definitely better than Child, Child of God. And I actually would give Pop 1280 the nut button, just knowing that this is a very dark 
dark read. Uh, but for sure, check it out. If you're interested, do not read anything else about it. Just go get it. It's very short. The audiobook is fantastic. Uh, and it is certainly good for like an in-between, maybe a palate cleanser. If you're looking for something a little bit more depraved, uh, you'll find it here. Okay, so now we're going to do the Patreon pick of the month. Uh, I just want to give a big shout out to all my patrons supporting the channel. Uh, I love putting uh, this up here every month. I love selecting a random book. It always expands my taste, but also I'm just so thankful that I have people uh, who want to support the channel. Even if you're not part of the Patreon, just thank you. Thank you for being here. Uh, as I was going insane on the couch being sick, I was just like, well, at least I can like reach out. I think that's something I can do is reach out to people and make this video. So even though this is a bit challenging, uh, it's making me very happy and it always does. So thank you guys for everything for the support. Let's see who wins for the month of August. All right. And the winner of the Patreon pick for August 2024 is number 80 and that is nemos and its use of weapons by ian m banks so uh this is a book that i have been wanting to read for a very long time because i loved player of games by ian m banks i thought it was one of the best i've it's it's one of two books i really regret leaving off a top 10 of the year list uh player of games and vanish birds by simon Geminis are two books i really regret not putting on my my end of the year list and if i could redo it i would Two books I think that are excellent that I've left off, but uh, the Culture series is a series I have so much interest in. But the use of uh, use of weapons is a very nonlinear story fashion, and it's very confusing. And I have to be in the mood for something like that. I just haven't been in the mood, but this will force my hand to read it, which I'm really excited about. And I'm also excited to see what else the Culture books are about, just because this is one of those sci-fi series that doesn't get like a ton of recognition in the mainstream. But Steven Erickson, when I was talking to him at ICFA down in Orlando. Uh, we were walking back from dinner and he said, I literally think it's like the greatest accomplishment in sci-fi. Like he thinks that like it is the peak of science fiction literature and he loves it. And just the way he talked about it got me so fired up. And then I read player of games and I was like, this is incredible. Um, so this is going to be my second culture novel. Ian M. Banks is an author. I have a lot of respect for just based on how much he accomplished. Uh, and it's, finally time to read use of weapons and i'm glad this happened because again when are you ever in the mood for something that's you know very dense non-linear like very rare that you're going to go for that so this is one that's been on the tbr for a long long time nemos i know you're going to be excited um i know many people are going to be excited because i've been asked to read this quite a bit uh so nemos number 80 thank you for the pick and i can't wait to read use of weapons this month so what else am i going to be reading in august i'm going to be reading empire of grass by tad williams uh i'm also going to be reading the last murder at the end of the world which i stewart something wrote that it's i think it might be a bestseller this guy's sold millions of books i found that randomly at a local bookstore and i was like this sounds awesome um so i'm going to read that i'm also going to be reading claire in the sun by kazuo ishiguru uh, and then on top of that, what else am I going to read? Oh, A Secret History, The Book of Ash by Mary Gentle, book one. I'll also be reading that, which was on my must read for this year. Devin M. Madsen has a book coming out that I cannot exactly remember the name of right now, but I remember the title was sick. I have that pre-ordered and I will be starting that at the end of August. I'll probably finish it in, in September. And I think that is about it. I mean, I'd love to fit in some other stuff, but that's a pretty packed schedule. But I think August is going to be just an absolute great month. And I feel like I'm in a really good groove with reading, probably because I've been confined to my couch for the last five, four or five days. Um, but I'm in a really nice groove and I'm, I'm having some good reads and it's always a good time to try new things. Again, I apologize if I came across scatterbrained or I sound weird or I was sniffling. I'm not sure. But if you like the video, you can hit like. If you dislike it, hit dislike. If you loved it, think about subscribing. Uh, thank you for your patience with me getting this out. And I hope you all are doing well. There's a Patreon in the description. It's optional, but always appreciated. But until I see you next time, be good, be safe, and remember to always keep turning the page. I'd like to give a big shout out to all my patrons, especially my Kingsguard, which include Bridger, Zan, Adam K, Emil, Jonathan J, Prithvi, Eric B, Chadia, Taylor D, Matthias D, Carlos, Yolanda, John C, John, Garrick, Evie, Henrik, Benjamin C, Sebastian M, Frank C, C. Scott, Jacob Wade, Darren, Jobot, Terrence F, Michael B, Lauren M, Nicholas E, Kai C, Kev, Ryan, Shad, Amanda V, Ikaika, RJ, Stuart C, Oscar A, Derry, Tanner, Tanner, sorry, Esther <laughs> Bully Bones, Damon H, Kuiper, Adam, Caitlin S, Curran G, Slay, Mark J, Mike J, Darnell H, uh, Sabo. Archipelago, which I think someone 
put that name because I know I can't say that word. And Social T is thank you all so very much. You are the best.